Uh, thank you. And hi, I'm John Miller. I'm a director of uh, forceforgood.org. Uh, as well as a fellow of uh, the World Academy of Art and Science and a member of the Human Security for All project team. Uh, previously, um, I was uh, chairman CEO of AOL and uh, chairman CEO of the general media group at News Corp and Fox and have a background in, in uh, trying to further some of the aspects of education. Um, I'm an advisor to uh, Harvard um, in its edX uh, endeavors and now uh, under the vice provost for advances in learning and formerly a director of Houghton Mifflin a large educational publisher in the United States. And we have a great panel uh, with us today around this very important issue of the confluence of business and education. And, and to me, it's, a, it's both a continuum and a two-way street. Um, what, can, what can happen in the education system that prepares people for businesses and, and promotes business uh, with societal impact? And, and how do we prepare for that? And then the other way, of course, is what happens inside those businesses and how do we train people uh, to deal with the societal impact issues, particularly around human security um, that we all uh, are here to discuss today. So a uh, terrific panel to talk about this and I'll just go through some of the folks so they don't have to introduce themselves. Um, so uh, we have uh, Channing Martin, who is the global chief diversity officer and social impact officer for Interpublic Group. Interpublic Group is one of the world's largest marketing services companies has over 50,000 employees that are divided into many divisions. So a, a lot to sort through there for Channing. Um, and previously she's been the diversity lead and strategic planner for the US State Department uh, for these areas, as well as the US Office of Personnel Management. So has both business and government experience. We have John Rose, who has uh, led the TMT, Telecom Media and uh, Technology Practices at both BCG and McKinsey for, for many years. As well as at BCG, he's uh, head up their private equity sector and public policy sector. Um, he also uh, runs a World Economic Forum group on data policy and privacy that is ongoing, as that's a continuing issue. Uh, John also has some very interesting experience that we'll get to in a few minutes uh, around what the COVID outbreak here in the United States, um, where he uh, led the team for BCG that worked on a seven state commission group that included New York State around the, the worst time of the pandemic and the response team uh, to that. And, and that'll get us into any number of issues. We then, we then have Mary Martin, um, who is a senior research fellow at the London School of Economics and director of the UN uh, Business and Human Security Initiative. This is a, approximately her third career. She was a journalist where she was the European business editor for the Telegraph and the Guardian, worked in strategic communications, has is the, also the author of the book, The Corporate Peace, which we should talk about, and has a training with a PhD uh, from Cambridge in International Relations. Uh, ben Verwyen um, is formerly CT, excuse me, CEO of British Telecom, of Alcatel Lucent, um, of KPN, a Dutch Telecom, the Dutch Telecom. And um, he's the, a foundational uh, board member of the World Economic Forum, He's a director of Ofcom, the British regulatory uh, uh, body. He is a knight of the British Empire. And I'm gonna get this wrong, so I'll have to apo I'll apologize to him in advance. He's an officer of the Orange, and I'm not gonna get the next uh, name, but uh, an award uh, in, uh, from his native uh, Netherlands. And he is chairman of Renewi, uh, a, a company that focuses on turning waste product into products. So uh, it's really a, a great group to, to talk about this. And what I might do, um, Mary, if you're there, is start with you and just explain, if you would, because I think people would want to hear about it, uh, what is the UN, um, the UN Business and Human Security Initiative? And then we can sort of get into a cross dialogue with, with, with all the folks. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, very glad to be here um, on this, this very esteemed panel. Um, so the UN Business and Human Security Initiative is a research program that uh, we set up at London School of Economics uh, with the support of the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. And the idea is to uh, work with companies and investors to encourage their engagement with societal challenges, whether it's the SDGs, COVID, climate change, uh, peace building, digital tech revolution, as we know, there are many. Um, and of course, these changes 
can pose a threat to business, but they are also moments of opportunity, uh, opportunity for new markets, for products and services. And the idea behind our program is that actually human security is a really good mobilizing concept and methodology for that engagement between business and society and its its challenges. Um, If business thinks in terms of human security, the human experience, the lived experience of everyday people and how challenges, but also business itself affects individuals and their communities, that provides for interesting new connections between business and the outside world, business and and society. And often I think political scientists like me have tended to think in terms of the negative consequences of, of business, you know, particularly in conflict zones and fragile settings. And I think we also want to highlight the the potential and the opportunities if you have more constructive dialogue around this idea and methodology of human security. So that in a snapshot is is kind of what we're about. Thank you, Mary. And we'll return to a number of the themes that uh, that you mentioned there. Particularly, I like the one of those last ones that that you mentioned, which is uh, I'll use uh, since I'm a director of the organization, business as a force for good. Uh, and, and, and uh, so we'll return to that. Uh, Channing, um, you've been obviously in the private sector um, and the public sector, you've seen both. And, and you know, one of the things I'm struck by, I'll, I'll say this in, in my own career, is I certainly didn't receive any training other than on the job, when it, if at all, around some of the issues of what's called diversity, inclusion, human security. None of that was part of like my, now I was, I was raised a little bit earlier, but none of that was you know, part of my either formal education or for a while business education. Um, we know that is changing, but do you feel people come out of school, business school prepared to understand these, these issues in the workplace? And, if, and, and anticipating some of that answer, if not fully prepared, you know, what, do you, you know, what, what do you see makes a difference uh, to get them ready to sort of lead and, and become leaders in, in, in organizations that embrace these kind of values? It's a great question. Thank you, John, for having me. It's great to be here. And, you know, I I do think you're right that things have changed um, quite a bit over time. And even in the world of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it has evolved. If we go back, you know, 30, 20 years ago, you know, companies and organizations were really just trying not to get sued. You know, it's really, it's a matter of EEO compliance procedure. We focused on affirmative action. Um, and what are the things that we just have to do that the government tells us we need to do? That world of, of compliance evolved into really thinking about strategy and the use of data, really using demographics to learn more about the organization. And then that even transformed into how do we hold people accountable? What are the barriers to entry for people and talent? That conversation then morphed into one of belonging and inclusion. We kind of had a shift from, well, diversity is great, but if we have diversity in isolation, that doesn't really do anything if we don't have inclusive spaces. Um, And I would say since 2020 in particular, the murder of George Floyd, and then during the pandemic with the explosion and awareness of Stop API Hate, the conversation around equity has come to the forefront in a way that we haven't seen in a really long time. And so throughout, I would say the last decade, I've seen programs and institutions like Cornell, like Georgetown GW, around certificates on diversity, equity, inclusion, or a certificate program to be a certified diversity professional, where I think institutions of higher learning in particular realize that there are gaps in the way we think about leadership. I think there are gaps on leadership philosophies anyway. Traditional leadership training isn't very effective. And so I've seen even in coaching programs that there isn't this inclusion around equity, bias, understanding human behavior, how to work with people across lines of difference are not included in those traditional programs. And so there is a shift. I think it's imperative that there is one in order to prepare leaders for the future of work, but we're very, we're very behind. And so I think you have folks in roles like mine or people like all of you on the panel who realize there are some challenges and 
as small as they may seem something like someone's uncomfortable to give someone feedback in the workplace because there are cultural barriers or unknowns or because someone's just different than I am, just the nature of being uncomfortable and comes into the situation, that's a barrier to business outcomes. If we're not able to have effective, productive conversations, um, we're not going to produce at work either. So it's changing. I don't think it's changing fast enough. And there's a big opportunity for business schools in particular to really embed some of the practices around equity and inclusion, not only in the way they think about the students that are there and the professors and the diversity of those professors, but also in the curriculum, in the way they're thinking about how do we learn from others of other world experience? How do we learn about leadership from other communities that we don't typically value when we think about the traditional business leader? That's great. And thank you. And Ben, I see you made it. Ben just landed uh, back um, back in the UK. So uh, glad to have you uh, here. And thank you for making it on, on uh, such a tight time frame. But I might, I might turn to you and ask, you know, in, in your business uh, career, you've, you've been responsible for the hiring of thousands of people, uh, if not tens of thousands. Um, and again, this, this same question of, you know, what, what degree of uh, preparedness do you think people come to the workforce with around these kinds of issues, around the larger potential for societal impact as a uh, aspect of business that is a positive aspect of business? And, and you know, what, if you cared to make a comment on educational institutions as how they could improve in this regard, I'd love to hear it. Well, let me first say that it, I'm delighted that we have the discussion on an issue that is really um, very important, not just for business or for society, but also for, I would say, understanding between the two groups. Um, and I like to look to this subject through the lens of trust. Because if there is one thing that business and society have in common, that is the battle for trust. Mm -hmm. And the tools for that um, may differ a little bit whether you are on the societal part or on the business part, but not too much. There is so much overlap between what is necessary to gain the trust, to gain the trust of the talent that you need in your organization to gain the trust of the customers that you want to entice, to gain the trust of the license to operate in the societies in which you want to operate. So the, the issue here is so much, not so much the flavor of the day. It's also not so much the fact that it's politicized, you know, looking from the outside and seeing the debate in the US, it seems that every logical thing has to be politicized. But from a global perspective, what I see is whether you like it or not, technology, behavior, and environment are changing radically the, I would say, definition of success. And let's be realistic. I live on a continent where there's war, real war, very close by, and it is hard to overestimate the impact it will have on the thinking, not today, but in the times to come. Because if we talk about human security, the word security is as important as human. So Ben, I do want to return to, to the situation in Europe on the ground there in, in, in a moment or two, because I, I, I do think it's very important. Um, but I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll, I'll start with your more first point um, uh, around trust. Um, and maybe John, uh, you're involved, as, a, as I mentioned in the intro, with the World Economic Forum's uh, pol uh, data uh, research and policy making there, which seems to be also an issue of trust around business, uh, um, as Ben as, as Ben uh, alluded to. So, uh, do you first of all do you see it that way as a battle for trust? Do you see the da the data work that you're doing in that particular case as part of that? And maybe you could put in that in that frame. And, and and again, I think part of the frame here is is how do we educate people to these kinds of issues too? Thank you, and and, and it's it's it, Great to be here with uh, everyone. Um, so two thoughts. One, one is I'll respond specifically to your, your question of trust, but I want to push also on this issue of, 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 of disruption, uh, which is related but different. Um, a lot of the battle around 
the use of data and data privacy, work I did with work, World Economic Forum, work that I've done as part of BCG's Henderson Institute is all about trust. Um, I think the issue isn't the data itself, which has been, I think, an unfortunate um, focus miss on the part of the regulators. It's the contextual usage of the data and the dialogue around what data do you have, how are you using it, and what sense of agency do individuals have relative to that data? And what's interesting is most organizations, not just private sector businesses, but also governments, are on the wrong side of that equation and they are, um, they are recklessly conservative in their use of data. Uh, and it is all about trust. Uh, they're, they're conservative because in order to try to avoid backlashes against data misuse, most organizations, not all, uh, color way within the lines, meaning they use data in ways that are far from the boundary conditions that most uh, consumers would be concerned about. That being said, that's how they think about managing trust, the actions they take. They don't believe that it is important um, to be transparent about what data they hold and how they're using it. They feel that their actions, much of which people can't see, are uh, speak, should speak for themselves. And so they're being conservative in their use, but they're being reckless in the way in which they're engaging their stakeholder communities. Because if you survey, which I have, uh, consumers all over the world, um, with a couple of countries that are notable exceptions, Korea and China. Um, consumers have a much greater tolerance for use cases of their data than organizations are pursuing, but they have almost no tolerance for not knowing. So when a individual finds out that someone's using data or is holding data that they were unaware of, it creates a trust breach. And you can model the economic impact in the private sector of what happens when there's a trust breach. And a trust breach creates economic harm that's materially greater than actually a physical data hack breach. One is viewed as spy versus spy. It happens. The other is viewed as an intentional stepping on rights. So trust is, I couldn't agree with Ben Moore, trust is at the center of it. But I think there's another concept I want to put into the conversation, which is there's a skill set that business schools and universities should and could be focusing on that they're not. And that is the skill of strategy and operations in the face of uncertainty and disruption. And it, 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 it leads to a different mindset, a different set of skills and a different set of tools. So I teach a course at Stern uh, in the graduate school called uh, Strategy and Transformation in the Era of Digital Disruption. And I apologize for the length of the title it got foisted on me, but the fundamental premise is um, most business thinking, whether it's strategy thinking or operational or organizational thinking is based on static models, not based on fluid and uncertain models. And the tools and mindsets that you have to take to a fluid and disruptive universe, and our world is disrupting on so many different levels. We can talk about the war that no one anticipated that's occurring in Europe and, and other uh, ter terrorist-like events. We can talk about climate change and sustainability as, a, as, another, as another disruption. We can talk about COVID as an from nowhere pandemic. The characteristic of the last couple of decades is more and more severe and frequent uncertain disruptions that have fundamentally changed the game. And I would argue uh, that COVID, um, and I had the opportunity to sort of quarterback uh, New York State's uh, COVID response, not just the medical response, but the how do you shut down, open, reopen society in the face of, of that degree of disruption and uncertainty. You know, you know what, what I would suggest is COVID has created, and I'll leverage Ben's comment about years to come, COVID has created the largest degree of social change 
and it changes in values, changes in working norms, changes in behavioral norms since World War II. Um, it has taken a group of people around the world out of their normal day-to-day -day lives for a long enough period of time for attitudes, values, and behaviors to permanently change. And we're only beginning to see the, the, the impacts of that. So I will pass it back to you, but I think trust matters. <laughs> But universities need to start building, and business schools need to start building in a different dynamic as they think about strategy and economics and uh, operations and org, because the underlying toolkit has to be modified to incorporate this notion of agility, uncertainty, disruption. Okay. So I, I, I do want to return to trust because we, we all touched upon it one way or the other. I think Channing, I think it's a little bit behind what you were saying too about trusting the environment that people are in um, and, and being able to trust that you know one's viewpoint. And, and as they say, you can bring your whole self to work as part of that trust too in, in business. But so I want to return to trust if we have time, but, but we did get into what I, what I was thinking about as these kind of discontinuous um, changes like COVID, like the war in Europe, and how they, um, how we, I'll speak for myself, how I think we and myself were unprepared for that kind of um, activity. Um, so Mary, as our, as our resident uh, academic on this panel, how does, how does business take up the challenge of, that John just threw down, which is to somehow train people for events no one can anticipate? And, and particularly as these events seem to increasingly relate to what we are calling human security. Uh, such as a war, a land war, or uh, a, a global pandemic. Um, so, you know, many other things we can't anticipate. We can anticipate, you know, some of the larger, you know, trends around poverty and things like that, perhaps. Um, but, you know, I would cite those two as things we could not have anticipated. So how does one get, does, how does one take up the challenge, John said, of having train, I'm, uh, I'm looking at my notes, train the skill um, around that kind of uncertainty? I think several things need to happen at once. I think um, business and even the next generation of business leaders need to raise their sights because I think for so long, certainly business schools, I teach graduate students and um, you know they, they come to us for kind of the, the bigger picture, if you like, but they're still too focused on the kind of the traditional skills you know, financial accounting, technical management, all that kind of thing. So I think um, just expanding the horizon, I mean, whether you want to talk about it in terms of risk to the business, because clearly these things um, are, you know, they pose a financial risk as well as a reputational risk. Um, all kinds of non-financial risks. So in one sense, uh, they need to to be aware of, of the bigger picture and, and look beyond the kind of the, and that includes data. I think there's a huge problem with the kind of data we use um, and the kind of the tools that, that are there for, for business leaders and indeed business students learning about it. I would also say they need to go in the other direction. They need to go get down to the ground level. And this touches upon the point that um, you are making, John and Ben, about trust. How do you um, recreate the trust thing. It's also by getting down to the personal level, the level at which people live their ordinary lives, experience whatever it is, whether it's conflict or poverty, health pandemic, and so on. And that's why I think, you know, that human security idea matters because it's not just a kind of generalist concept about, oh, bad things happen in the world. We face, you know, terrible interconnected threats. It's not just a health pandemic. It's a threat to our uh, ways of working. It's a threat to our um, social relations. It's a threat to education and so on. Um, so I think you need to, as it were, get down to that lived experience level. And I think actually that's what business could be really good at, um, but often isn't. There's too much, if you like, abstraction, general kind of um, general learning and so on. Um, and, and the trust thing is important because you can build that trust if you if you get that proximity to the the lived experience and and the the everyday level so i would say it's it's an answer 
partly to the trust question, and it's also a kind of a better direction to go in for future preparedness. I mean, the tech sector, I think, is, is an interesting example because by its very nature, it tends not to be proximate. It tends not to be on the ground because it can sell products and services that are, by definition, remote. So there is a bit of a disconnect, if you like. So when things go wrong, and often they go wrong in the in the tech sector because people are using, in, if we take the example of conflict, people are using the tools and services of tech often in a, in a negative way, in a way that maybe even feeds conflict. And the companies are just not, they're too far, they're too remote, they're too disconnected from, from that everyday use and affordance of that technology to be able to re react well. So my answer is say it goes in both directions. People need to have a sense, even if they go down the route of, of business, they think they want to be in finance or they want to be in management or whatever. The bigger picture matters increasingly. And that idea of having the connection with the with the grassroots and the ground level, because in the end, it's about people and how they live their lives, how they consume your products and your services and how they're affected by the big global events, but in their own very particular way. Channing, what, what, what Mary just said is that uh, is the bigger picture matters. Um, I certainly like to think so. I, I, I'm willing to guess you do as well. Without naming names, some of the, the uh, areas you've worked in the private sector, do you feel that efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion, social impact, are checking the box, or do you feel they are more come from a, a more hopefully now deep deep rooted sense of uh, values and purpose inside of corporations to achieve? I hope to achieve what Ben is describing as trust. I think there's a spectrum. I think there are organizations of varying sizes and in industries that are checking the box as an exercise. And I think that there are many that have realized that if people are your number one asset and those people include your talent, they include your customers, right? That if you're really going to be a number one priority, then you have to identify what the values of the organization and the business are and embed that into the culture. So I think we see a spectrum. I think the ones that have done it really well have truly done the work and embedded in their culture. And they have the difficult conversations and almost the realignment or rebirthing of the company, which takes time and it's hard. Um, but what I've seen is that those companies where their values alignment is there, where people are bought into that, they're treated with the same respect aligned to their values, their products align with their values, their customers' feedback also aligns with their values. They are more flexible. They are more agile. They do withstand through long seasons of uncertainty in a more positive way. They're able to fail fast and course correct because it's baked into their culture. And there as is an element to trust to the point of the conversation. I think when a company does what they say they're going to do, people trust them, whether that's their consumer or that's their talent. Um, so with that being said, there are quite a few companies that are checking the box. I think especially those that um, <laughs> have large populations of people that have not experienced lived lived experiences outside of their own. I think what Mary is saying is right. And that's what a lot of this work is about, is getting on the ground level, being around those of different lived experiences. I think it's hard to understand lived experience if everyone in your organization or your team has the same lived experience as you do. It's really hard to identify um, and think about how can our business impact, you know, positive economic outcomes for women around the globe if we don't really understand the gravity of that problem or that challenge, or if we don't have the concept of what it really means to be from a country um, that is, you know, has experienced decades of war. It's really hard to. It's re it's really hard for people to address challenges and tackle problems especially systemic ones, when they don't even really have a grasp of the systemic ones within their, within their community. And so we want people to be able to do that in a way that does feel safe for them. Um, but again, it, it is the trust. 
Yeah. Ben, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a real world problem um, that that that, uh, that I faced as a director of a public company, um, and then John, I'd be interested in your 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 uh, response as well. Um, when the uh, land war did break out um, in, in Europe and when Ukraine was invaded, we our operations for our uh, for this company were headquartered um, in Poland, uh, run by a Ukrainian woman. Um, and, and she oversaw that sector, including Russia. And our initial uh, reaction was we should um, stop our operations in Russia. We should, we should pull out of Russia. She actually argued for keeping the company going in Russia, even though she had some strong feelings about everything that was going on, as one might imagine, um, because she felt it would put our employees in Russia in danger um, if, we, if we pulled out. So, so we did keep going. Uh, in Russia, we took a little bit um, uh, of public, uh, um, uh, um, a little bit of a hit publicly, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, because we didn't pull out of Russia, but we did so for the reasons I just described. So you could argue um, mm -hmm. we might have cre you know, created an environment with a little bit less trust in our, uh, with our business uh, stakeholders, because we also couldn't fully articulate all of the reasons for their safety. Um, how, so my question is, is not what would you have done, but how, <laughs> but how do you train for this? Because this this is this is a real world you know human security question. How, how could you know? Because it just yeah. becomes a judgment question, I think. Yeah. So uh, I heard the conversation we just had. Yeah. Um, the real world is is slightly different. I've been able to run global companies. Well, we have the philosophy that, you know, we are going to be global in our thinking. We are going to do the values that are important around the globe and all the rest of it. At the essence, people are very, very local. And, and if your headquarters is in Paris, the local paper in Paris has more impact than the Wall Street Journal. And if your headquarters is in New York, you can jump all the way you want it may be that the China Morning Post has more subscription than 10 of your Wall Street journals. It doesn't have the impact. So let's be realistic. Everybody is a human, as a human being has its roots and the roots are truly important to understand and to value. What you want to do is you give other people in your organization with their roots, the opportunity also to have the power to make it domestic for them. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Second, I talked about trust. Let me talk about credibility. So if people say something about, yeah, business doesn't understand, they are 100% right. A lot of business does not understand the challenge in front of us. But when it comes to credibility, and Edelman is the organization that every year when it is the World Economic Forum comes out, the institution people trust most is business. And the institution that people trust most is their employer. Hmm. Now, I'm not a fan of that. And I, because, you know, I'm passionate about politics. I think politics has dropped the ball in a big way because some of the tools that are around in politics, like hmm. dealing with truth, has been eroded by data, technology, and the opportunity that others see to make it into a full contact sport and people don't like that so why do i say all of those things and then i'm going to answer your question john it's local it is very personal there is no other thing to do than to weigh the values if you would be having your headquarters in europe and you know that russia is not an average war, you will have a different outcome than if your headquarters is in Brazil and you look to it in a geopolitical sense as we looked to the wars in Chechnya or in Syria or the other things. So the answer is sensitivity. You need to be sensitive. Is there a training for that? No, but there's one thing you can do. You can select on it. And we have been poor in having the diversity in the selection of leadership, because lookalikes were always preferred over something different. I think we have now entered the phase where 
I, I would not say boards because boards are mainly old men like me, but um, organizations have the ability to select, have a better feel for difference. And that's what needed. Yeah, Ben, I think that's such an excellent answer, if I may say. Um, I, I, but I also think it goes to, I'm, I'm going to throw it to John, but I think Channing, you would agree with this, that it also goes to making sure that you have people to select from. They have to come up from somewhere to be in, in the consideration set. And that, that does relate, I think, to, to you know, how do we educate the right kinds of people um, and get them the training that, that puts them in the consideration set so that they can be selected for roles that can have the kind of impact that you described. Actually, John, I'll go to you in a second. I, Jenny, I, I think you would agree with that, um, but I don't I can, want to put words. I'll in add that. after. I'll add after John goes. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to uh, go go ahead because I'm going to add a. I'm going to switch a little bit for John, but please um, go ahead. Well, I was me, right? Yes, Channing. Yes. Okay. Well, just one thing that that Ben mentioned that I really loved is this that this notion that people are local. And I think that's so brilliant. And it's a concept that we, we often overlook and we're expecting things sometimes from people that they've never been socialized, taught or told how to do, right? And so we are talking about systemic and global challenges um, and thought processes and values that we kind of want to undo that people have had for generations. So I will just say that like, this isn't, it's not easy what we're talking about doing. Even the concept of, of bringing in someone different or learning or seeking something different to learn from is not what most of us were taught how to do and how to live our lives and how to survive and how to, and from an American context, achieve this American dream was not to go outside of your comfort zone to achieve that. So I'll just I'll just put that out there because I think that was a really good point that Ben made. Um, I think there's a little bit of a myth that the talent doesn't doesn't exist in certain areas and spaces. Mm -hmm. um, like you know, and that is something I think that cor that corporations have been working on trying to. Um, in the beginning, that was kind of the reason why there was a mm -hmm. lack of let's just say kind of demographic diversity across companies was because the talent didn't exist. Now we've seen spaces and organizations and groups and people who are saying, no, no, the talent does exist. We're not meeting people where they are. So I think there's this notion that if we want something different, we also have to act differently, which means you have to recruit talent differently. It means you have to do something internal to attract multiple types of people, whether it's a, the global majority, people from around the world, people that don't take a linear path of, you know, business school, this company, you know, whatever that looks like, we have to do things differently if we want to embrace different. And then you have to set those people up for success when they get there, because don't say you want different and then the reward system, the recognition system, the promotion system is all based on the old. So that's the, that my challenge with, you know, does the talent exist? The talent does exist. And we're also talking about decades and centuries in some countries of socialization, values, and families around what profession you should be. I work in marketing and advertising. I am struggling with how little percentage of Asian male talent we have in our organizations in the industry. It's really hard pressed for me to find you know, a first generation, second generation American family from many countries in Asia that are telling their kids to achieve the American dream. I want you to be a creative. My friends that are African and Asian or have African Asian parents, they're told to be engineers, doctors, and lawyers. True. That's not something that I'm going to be able to undo as a chief diversity officer, right? So I'm realistic in that. Um, so I think these are some of the nuances around what's available talent, what isn't, but how do we need to reframe our thinking around how we create spaces that are inclusive for people. And if we really are caring about global pandemics and wars and the world as we should be, human security is something that everyone should have access to. There, these are challenges that our organizations can help to solve. And as the trust in the government continues to decline, 
I've, I have seen where organizations and companies have been able to rise to that occasion. Yeah. So I'll pass it over to uh, John. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That, thank you. There, there's a lot there. I, I keep making notes on what I want to discuss and falling behind. We may, uh, we may uh, have to extend them. Ask them to have us back. But um, John, I'm going to ask you a question and you can, you can do like Ben. You can, take, you can comment on some other stuff, but get around to my question eventually, um, which is when you worked with the, the New York state government and the other states that were involved in that consortium, this, this to my mind goes to that trust and credibility question, you had to uh, recommend in completely unprecedented circumstances what was effectively the shutdown of the local economy and a very important economy uh, uh, for a period of time. That is not a decision to be taken lightly, and it's not a decision that, at least uh, to my knowledge, had been taken uh, previously in, in our history. So, you know, how, how do you, you know, and again, it goes to this point of how does one actually have the requisite skill training to, to tackle such a thing and, and now, that, now that we in a, enter in a world that has these, uh, I'll call them discontinuous events that are occurring perhaps at a, at a greater rate? So I'll start with your question, but I want to cycle back to attach to some of the things you mentioned sure. earlier and, and some of ben, Ben's comments. But the hard decision wasn't to shut stuff down. The hard decision was to figure out how to open stuff back up mm -hmm. and what opening it back up meant. The shutdown was really simple. Uh, New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic and the healthcare network was on the edge of collapsing. And so the shutdown decision that not only New York State made, but lots of people in lots of different countries made was, 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 was a relatively simple decision. If the hospital systems got overwhelmed, the first responder systems would have collapsed. And there was a real view towards an anarchistic environment that was real. Um, and by the way, China started with shutting stuff down. Everybody looked and said, okay, that sort of worked for a period. So as this moved around, the simple decision was to close. The hard decision, knowing nothing about the disease at that point in time, was how do you think about opening up? And what governors on opening do you place? You know, and, and what's the balance between um, safety of society, social needs for connection and family, economic reality of people needing to be able to work and productivity as an engine needing to spool. Um, those, were the, those were the hard decisions. And some of the mechanisms that people put in place were, were actually almost unheard of relative to the way government operated in the past. So for two years at 7.30 in the morning on Wednesday, we had a seven state Northeast conversation about where are we, what have we learned and what does that imply about who's gonna try to open what up in what way and what are you thinking? And so we moved from a siloed based problem solving model of multiple states making decisions by themselves to a collaborative problem solving dynamic where everybody preserve, preserve their own decision rights, but where the degree of real time sharing and problem solving just, there's no example that you can look at going back decades in the US where that type of open, quiet collaboration and what's fascinating in a good way And that happened not just about opening stuff up. It happened with, crap, we have a vaccine that makes a huge difference. And we're getting dosages per week that are less than 1% of the population that need to be vaccinated. How the hell do we figure out who gets the vaccines and how do we distribute them? Again, we had another weekly cycle of folks who were what have you learned? What are you seeing? How do you ensure throughput? I mean, just all sorts of stuff. And what was great about that crowdsourced approach is that none of it ended up being written about. No one was, you know, it was just, it was, but it made a huge difference. But it was really decision-making in the face of massive uncertainty and the use of data to create real-time learning to change the decisions. 
So a lot of what we thought mattered at the start of shutdown, you know, ended up like, like cleaning, ended up being irrelevant. And so how did we take something we thought was a safety thing and stop doing it? And how do we run a network of communications? So all of the people everywhere who were responsible for doing these things, which we required them to do, now know that they don't have to. And where are the feedback loops? So it was, it was really just a very, very different dynamic. And that's where, Ben, I'm going to take modest exception, which is, no, you can't pre-solve the answer to it, the specifics of the current dynamic in Russia with Ukraine. But leadership teams in organizations are not routinely asking the question, how, do we, how are we going to respond to uncertain disruptions? And they're not routinely taking executive committee time and or board time to actually talk about those issues and exercise well, what would, we, what would we do if X occurred? And I'm not talking about formal tabletop exercises of the kind that governments do to respond to a disruption in the power grid or a terrorist attack, but I am talking about the engagement discussion and thought processes about what do we do if, not because you'll have playbooks that'll matter, but because you will exercise muscles in asking different questions and developing I mean, Shannon, to your point, different ways of engaging. I mean, the disasters that would have occurred had we not been on the phone every Wednesday at 7.30 because of interdependencies that no one had ever thought of. Yeah. But like the first time Connecticut opened its malls and New York, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Massachusetts hadn't, those malls became overrun and materially unsafe because the population all just drove there. Right. So, so the practice you can do, there was a there was a senior partner at McKinsey, Dick Foster, who I learned a lot from. He's the person who in, in developed the S-curve that we always use. In, everybody uses this sort of become a, a, almost a, a, a business standard language. His, fe his second thought, which was more profound, was strategy is not about figuring out the answer. It's about figuring out the right questions. And what I would argue is executive teams today aren't asking the right question about how do they think about disruption and uncertainty and what do they do about it? They're really not asking the question at all. And if you look at the incredible amount of effort and energy that goes into advisors and where they spend their time, 99.9% .9 of it is all about certainty, not about uncertainty. And I would just respectfully suggest then that if we could take the 99.9 .9 and drive it to 90% and 10% of the dialogue was around uncertainty, what do you do in different types of uncertain circumstances, which today everybody would view as a waste of time, that would build some of the muscle to be able to be agile because actually you can't pre-solve the answer. You can't have the playbook, but you can build agility. Yeah. Well, I think that does go back into to education too. So we're gonna we're gonna run uh, out of time. So I'm just gonna go back around my screen. So so Ben Channing and Mary, you may get the last word. Um, if we could just uh, thirty seconds on any topic you want that we haven't covered, but I'll, I'll I'll ask one question in case you want to answer this, which is and Ben, you mentioned this. Uh, you had less face in the political uh, environment than perhaps uh, in, in other times. So does that have to be made up for by the education and business worlds and I'll, I'll pose that as a question if anybody wants to take it, or if you want to make a last uh, comment on, on each. Try to keep it to 30 seconds, folks, because I'm just watching the clock. Okay, who do you want to start? Yeah, Ben, ben first, Channing, and then Mary. Okay, so first of all, great conversation, and I, I'm converted 10% of the time on the unstructured. <laughs> it's a great idea. It's a great idea, and we should do that. We should embrace it. Um, uh, I, I would say that you can't compensate for the lack of credibility in another part of society by over crediting your part. It doesn't work that way. So we have to reach out. It's not just an isolation. It's not just a problem. We have to reach out to the others. The we is more important than the me. Thank you. Channing. 
Well, that's great. It's hard to follow that. So I might just end it with a question or something to ponder for next time that I hope this group can get together is how do we tackle or move forward when what we would probably textbook classify as um, a lack of safety or human security to be a norm? And I'm thinking about, you know, mm. whether it's the Western response to mass shootings, where when someone hears it now, you're like, oh, there was another one. But before there was a definitely a different response to that. When something becomes normal, that shouldn't be. Um, and like the pandemic, now when I talk to people, if someone, many people, if they get COVID, it's just another cold. And so I, I wonder how does that impact the future of the human security conversation? Is it the goal that, um, that we normalize certain things like that, which means they are less of a threat to us, or is the goal um, to have hyper awareness on all of the things that impact human security? I don't have the answer, but I'd love to explore that. Well, what a, what a great question. And, and those are listening from the World Academy, I hope you heard that because we should think about how we work that into some future discussions. Uh, Mary, uh, any, any last uh, thoughts? Yeah. Um, it's not an answer to Channing, but I'm going to put my academic hat on. And one uh, way that the human security idea encountered a lot of criticism in the early days was that people felt it's a risk of securitizing people. You make them into somehow uh, you, you you almost weaponize bodies and, and everyday experiences. And that's not a good thing. I'm going to steer away from that. I would say that if we want to think in terms of human security, and especially for business and biz educating business, whether we're educating business students or whether we're trying to re-educate business leaders, think about it also in terms of a methodology, a way of doing things, using it as a lens for making decisions, decisions about investing, decisions about risk management, whatever. If you center it in that idea of it's about people, it's about, as Ben said, local, it's about communities and that perspective, it's on the ground um, and that we all face different threats and challenges and they tend to be connected as the COVID pandemic showed us, then I think that is a way to start teaching or learning about relearning about how we do business and how we run you know we run the economy economies for for the future great well thank thank you all very much i, I hope they invite us back to continue this conversation because i think we just we just got started thank you all very much and i think we're just over time so we should stop there and take care bye-bye